The relationship between time, space and physicists could be described as, well, you'll see. Hi, my name's Alex. I've argued enough for a lifetime. In this series of videos, I zoom in on the perspective science can give you. Find the playlist in the overlay cards or in the description. Because nature's complex, science isn't. I was asked for more videos on space and time. That's the premise. I can always point you towards the spherical cow thing, of course, which touches on space and time as well, but, you know, there's more to it. There always is. There's a word covering both space and time. Space-time. In physics, space-time is, and I quote Wikipedia, any mathematical model which fuses the three dimensions of space and the one dimension of time into a single four-dimensional manifold. All right, it's the spatial dimensions we know, up, down, sideways and front, back, meshed together with time in one big something with a capital S. That's odd. Why would you do that? The short answer is visualization in mathematical spaces. Well, let's dive into it. When special relativity was developed, for example, it was assumed that all physical laws were constant over time. That is, they were the same back in the day and would be the same in a billion years. The other assumption was that the speed of light was constant for all observers, and regardless of the motion of the light source. It's part of the Pantheon now, of course. It's a physical law. But it wasn't necessarily then, in the beginning of the 20th century, when all of this came together. It was merely an assumption. There were experiments, and these showed the assumption to most likely be true. So imagine a lamp approaching you fast enough, that is, at say a constant tenth of the speed of light. The speed of light is some number. It's not even important what exactly it is. Okay, if you must know, it's 299792458 meters per second. But again, that number isn't the point. The point is that the light from that lamp coming at you should be by 10% faster than that number. The speed of light in a vacuum is exactly that number. It doesn't change, you know. We can measure that it doesn't. Find out and read about the Michelson interferometer and the Michelson-Morley experiment to see how we measured that. Links below, as always. Now let's get that straight. We're talking about a situation in which something has to give. In one case the lamp is moving, in the other case it's not. There has to be a way of differentiating these cases. The fact is that something does give in these cases. Time and space do. They have to change so that the speed of light can stay constant. See, it turns out that to make everything work, we need to make time go slower. Time moves slower for both of you, according to the theory. Find the twin paradox to know what I mean. On the other hand, we also have to make sure that space is shorter for one than for the other which it is for both of you. Well, no, but yes, but kind of not at all. Anyway, you find the ladder paradox. What? All of this is perfectly true in the sense that we can measure the effects. Clocks on satellites, for example, have to account for this time dilation and reset accordingly. Just know that space and time are coupled to each other if the speed of light is constant like that. How do we deal with that fact? By maths, that is, by models. And the best model for reality here is somewhat, shall we say, unfortunate for anybody trying to simply learn. Cause what is good for those who want to learn may not be good for those who want to use the knowledge. That's true for any coding ever done, for example, and it's also true here. Here we put the time onto an imaginary axis in our coordinate system. Yes, I just said that. Okay, so what did I really want to say now? This little trick makes it possible to visualize the so-called Lorentz transformations as rotations in a four-dimensional Euclidean space. That's what I meant by visualization in mathematical spaces. Why is that good? 
Because Lorentz transformations are mathematical operations which we find reflected in nature time after time after time. Don't bother knowing what Lorentz transformations really are. I remember having hated when my professor turned to them for the first time. I saw from the start that I needed to calculate for a while in order to understand what he had told me to begin with. If you've listened to Imagination and Mathematics, by the way, a video in the Audio Science playlist, then you know why I say that. There's also a link down there for those who must know what these transformations are. For the rest of you, it really doesn't matter all that much for what we want to do here. I usually don't bother with the how. The internet is awesome at telling you the how. I can tell you why, though. There are oodles of space-times, for general relativity too, for example, and they all appear, as they say, out of the maths. What that means is, they appear in people's heads and those people find them useful to the point of telling other people about them and then having these other people be happy to use them too. Then all of these people use them to calculate stuff as effectively as possible. They're tools, the space-times, not the people. They're also more than that, and borderline physical things. The space-times, not the people. But that's a story for another day. For now, let me know in the comments what you think. Are you a student or a scientist who thinks I'm talking out of my ass here? Or are you simply interested and want to have the right starting point for learning? Well, in all cases, please comment, find and talk to each other. Thank you.